Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're continuing our study uh, dealing with Samson, just finishing up these lines. Um, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have this morning to study your word. And we just invite your spirit's presence as we continue to look at judges. Help us to understand these things, to correct us of any errors we may have in our understanding. And I pray, the Lord, that you can bless each person studying these things, that they can understand them, that it can affect their lives, and that they can share these things um, with others in a way that's understandable as well. Be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. And uh, looking over a lot of this material, I kind of I have a better idea of how I want to organize the presentations. Now, um, I was looking over some of these other charts. So when it comes to Samson chapter 15, um, we had, uh, what was this here? We had this line here, um, uh, chapter 15. And you can see that this, this line that we have um, is a little bit different. That is, we, we, we created these lines. Uh, this line here addresses the first time we have the first day of the first month to April 5th, 2030. And so I know it's hard to kind of look at it and just jump in it. Um, but uh, there was, let me see here. This was based upon this uh, 1,301,000 days, which um, is that period of time that's here. It's the 212th prime. Um, Uh, the Mayan calendar date of 130100 is the second month of the 12th day in 1435 of the Hajij calendar, so the year of the Hajij. Um, it's 187 metonic cycles in 111 months. So this we're going to have to sort out, and um, this we're going to need to understand. So... Uh, in the presentations we're going to do at camp meeting, I'm going to have to try to explain this. I don't really want to go through it right now. And uh, But one of the things we see in Judges chapter 15, you'll see it down here at the bottom. Uh, we have Pentecost as Judges 15, 1. Uh, but when we get into the story of Delilah, we get Judges 16, verse 1. And 16, verse 1 is a symbol of the wave offering. Right. So the wave offering happens on the 16th day of the first month and Pentecost follows um, 49 days later. So. That is those two presentations, Colin's presentation and Odilio's presentation. And then you can see on this line, we don't have things in order. We have Judges 16, 4 is November 9th, 2019 and Judges 15, 18 is July 18th, 2020. And. Um, so there's a lot of detail in Samson when we went, when we went through it before that, that I don't remember, that is, I don't remember why, why we put these things in this order. So, so it's something that I'm going to look at. I have to go through the videos and figure out what we were talking about, but, but anyway, we have this, um, this wave offering symbol here again as well, Judges 16.1, lined up with Judges 15.20, December 25th, 2021, and then Judges 15.1, February 12th, 2022. So again, these aren't in order. <clears throat> so I don't remember these. Like, I don't remember all of the reasons behind it. I remember that we did that, but I don't remember why. 
And, and you can see here what we were talking about yesterday with the lion roaring. We can see that that's 911 and 119 down here at the bottom, right? And then you have the lion and the honey. That's going to be that um, uh, the story of, so he kills the lion. Then you have, he comes and he finds the honeycomb in the carcass of the lion. And again, we're going to have the name of Samson. And the name of Samson has this characteristic of 81, both in uh, the reverse gematria and the forward gematria, if I remember correctly. So if you type in Samson, it's going to be the normal sum is going to be 81. All right, so I'll just show you this here. So you can see here, here's the name Samson. You can see the normal sum is 81 and the reverse sum is 81. So that helps us place this at July 18th uh, as a symbol of the, the second angel's message. So that's why we had done that. So, <clears throat> so there's some of these diagrams I'm going to have to try to clean up uh, for the, the camp meeting notes because there's just a lot of information. This was the November 24th date, that 11,900 11, days from April 26, 1990, which is 168 days from November 9th, 1989. And um, then we also had this 1629 days to June 9th, 2018. That's when time came into the message. And 859 days from July 18, 2020, which in base eight is 1533. And uh, so there was just a lot of different symbols that are here in this line. So trying to sort these out in the line of Samson, Samson has all of these symbols. And uh, so, but we have the basic line of Samson here with the line of Samson and Delilah. And so that's what we've been working through. So it's just, we spent a lot of time on Samson. And yet, yet and Samson is, I think, the most comprehensive of, of all the lines is that it covers uh, a lot of different territory. It has lots of different um lines within it it uh, is very present truth to the movement right now especially if we think about the fact that samson is um in this line of the judges it's the january 11th 2023 date so this is the point in which this movement is right now we're in that history so it seems logical that Samson's going to speak the most to this present history and this history leading up to this camp meeting and including the camp meeting. <clears throat> so when we think about um, what this line means, uh, the, one of the things that we saw with the, the line of Manoah, which we had just developed in this last week or so um, is that this is really about the character of Christ. This is about a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is about the looking glass vision. This is uh, a message that speaks to our present need. And uh, it's vital for us to understand this. I mean, I don't know how to emphasize because everything is important. But right now we're at a point in this movement where we really um, need to understand um, ourselves. We need to know Christ. We need to have that light shine in the darkness. We need to be able to see our sins, to confess them, to forsake them. Uh, if God is going to use us. And 
this is what the story of Samson is about. It reveals to us our nature. Because Samson, even though he's a type of Christ, he's a type of Christ in Christ's humanity. The weaknesses of humanity are evident in Samson. And those are our weaknesses. And yet Samson is going to be victorious. So that's the message of Samson. <clears throat> now, we had been addressing here, so uh, in this top line of Samson that you see, we had gone through this seven weeks, the wheat harvest. We have the symbol of 168 hours, uh, which is the seven days. And we're just saying that seven days brings us uh, from December 25th, 2021, to June 10th, 2022. Um, and we don't know particularly what that means. Uh, we just we just have that date. And so we, we placed it there, 168 days, day for an hour of the seven days symbolically. We have Odilia's presentation, which obviously is after that date. And then we addressed this 268 and the 1629. So that was that chart that addressed the Thanksgiving in 2022. And that's where we saw this. 2,688 days, extending to April 5th, 2030. So that's one of the things that Samson does, these lines, is it points us to that date, which we have no idea what it's representing, other than symbolically it's rep representing when the divorcement is complete. Now, the third angel arriving here is this first day of the 10th month. So you can see how that first day of the 10th month is going to be connected to the first day of the first month, right? So here you have the divorcement. Okay, so we have that divorce that's between those two dates. <clears throat> it's from the strange wives. And, and then when we deal with this line of Samson, the darkness, as we understood it, had to do with uh, the understanding of time symbolically within, um, connected with watching and waiting. So Adventists are afraid of time, right? They don't want to talk about time or dates or anything. I mean, one of the oppositions that we had, and one of the main reasons we had an opposition to the 2520, why it was such a, a lightning rod uh, doctrine or teaching, is that it was a number, right? Jeff never had that type of opposition to talking about uh, the time of the end or parallel of Millerite history or any of the other things that he had talked about because it didn't it didn't, you know, hit a sensitive spot, so to speak, right? It didn't hit a nerve. But as soon as you started talking about a number, people start thinking time setting, right? So remember, before we actually started setting dates, people were accusing us of time setters. The first thing I ever heard um, from somebody as an opposition when I was studying the 2520 is that Ellen White says there's no time after 1844. So they made an assumption that when we were talking about the 2520, that we were talking about the year 2025 or something like that. They had no idea. They didn't even get the number right. Um, but they just saw it as time setting because it was a number. And that's just speaking to the fear that Adventists have regarding time setting of any kind. So the fact that we eventually ended up setting some dates and those dates failed confirmed for many people their suspicions regarding this movement, right? So what were their time setters? We were right, you know, they, they had a date, okay? So but we know that time is part of the watching and waiting and that it has been a witness that God is leading us. And none of our time setting is in contravention of Ellen White's direct counsel against setting time or the idea that, you know, the third angel's message does not hang on time, right? 
She's talking about setting dates in the future and expecting some event. And, and I think that would include even a restrictive idea of time that, you know, the Sunday law is going to be brought in by Trump. So that is going to put a restriction upon time saying that it has to be Trump because Trump, he's obviously limited as far as time is concerned. I mean, we don't know how long he could, he will live. I mean, he could live to be 110. It's possible, not very likely, but um, <clears throat> it puts a limit on things. And then we also have, of course, Ted Wilson. Now, Ted Wilson could live a long time, but I don't think he's going to be the general conference president, uh, you know, much longer. I mean, he might do another term again. We don't know. But we have all these conditions that are being set that are going to limit time. If we believe that, you know, that this election, Trump has to win it. Once this election passes in in uh, 2024, uh are we still going to be looking for Trump to be president if he's not elected? Right. So these, these are part of the problems that we have if we're going to be setting dates. So we can't, we can't put those restrictions. And, and we were, we're aware of that even prior to setting time when we said that Trump was going to be president, that he was going to bring in the Sunday law. Uh, there was sort of people who were a little bit uh, tense about that within the movement in that they said, well, you know, you're, you're setting time and especially people outside the movement by, by saying that Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. They looked at it as a type of time setting, but we know that time is, is a witness to these lines. And that as we go through this, these events, uh, these dates, these symbols, uh, help us understand God's leading. They're evidence of that. And this is going to be one of the things that's, uh, that we have to make clear. So when we're doing these presentations, Ar Iran's going to be doing presentations dealing with the symbolic use of numbers. Um, Stephen is going to be laying out the chronology of the judges and how that chronology and all these different chronologies relate as symbols to the present time. Um, you know, and I'm going to be, of course, covering the, these lines of the judges. And somebody just looking from the outside um, may not see what it is we're doing. Now, I know that Dwight's studies and his messages have been regarding uh, the character that's needed and, and basically a warning about uh, uh, a warning to us about our own characters. Um, and also of course, the condition of this movement because we know that this message is meant to stir and awaken this movement to its responsibility. And, you know, people just looking at this scene, all these numbers can see it as numerology. They can see it as time setting, uh, but it's none of those. And, and so we have to be able to show this clearly um, what this means. <clears throat> One is it is line upon line. So without these lines, without a clear Clear, clearly identifying the beard of darkness and without clearly identifying the messages that these lines represent, these dates wouldn't be very meaningful. That is, we wouldn't know what they mean. We would have dates and we would have structures and we have symbols, but we'd have no way of placing them in context. So when we look at this line of Samson, then we see that it's addressing this issue of time but it's addressing this within this movement because that this movement prior to 9-11 is in the same situation as the church in regard to time. Jeff is opposed to time setting, right? Many of all of us are, right? Uh, we're opposed to time setting. 
and, and Jeff is cautious because he sees lots of people using time elements from the Bible and trying to predict events. And so he's not interested in that. But when 9-11 comes around, it provides a symbol that now starts to unfold a message of time. And that's going to be this increase of knowledge from 9-11 to 11-9. And this is going to be where the lion roars, right? So we're going to know that this lion roars here at 11-9, but that's also connected to 9-11. So we have the lion roaring. Um, maybe what we should put here... Um, just to remind us of this lion in this line. <clears throat> so when we have this lion roaring, um, now is this the lion of the tribe of Judah? So is it the lion of the tribe of Judah that this, this lion is roaring? I would think so. Okay, and what does that mean then? Didn't we apply this with what we've read out of, out of Revelation? Okay, yeah. Now, um, now the lion of the tribe of Judah, what does he do in Revelation? Revelation chapter 5. Because you see a lamb slain with seven horns and seven eyes, right? And you see this line of the tribe of Judah. He opens the book. Right. So... So Christ seated upon the throne. There's this one seated upon the throne. He has this book sealed with seven seals. Um, and there's no man that can open the book. And then we see the lamb slain with seven horns and seven eyes. And then we see that it's going to be the line of the tribe of Judah that's going to prevail and open the book, right? And, and we understand that these seals uh, relate to um, the history of the fall you know, of, of the Roman Empire, right? Um, well, I guess not the Roman Empire. That's going to be the trumpet. So, so how do we describe the seals? They're dealing with, I guess, the church, the apostasy of the church, right? Right. Okay. So we got uh, so we got the seven seals. Then we're going to have the seven trumpets. So we have the seven seals. They're going to be opened. And in opening the seals, we're also going to have the um, – we're going to have the seven uh, – uh, the seven thunders that are going to be sealed as well. So we have these, um, the book, the line of the tribe of Judah opens up the book of Daniel. Now, how does this relate? I'm trying to think how that, that works. Um, hmm. I can't remember how. Okay, so here's a statement by Ellen White. Once again, the Savior was presented to John under the symbol of the line of the tribe of Judah and of a lamb as it had been slain. These symbols represent the union of omnipotent power and self-sacrificing love. So the line represents... Um, now, we, we could say that the seven horns is obviously um, representative of power, but the lion of the tribe of Judah also represents omnipotent power and the lamb slain, self-sacrificing love. So if we have the union of omnipotent power and self-sacrificing love, what do we have? What is this symbol? Wouldn't that be God's character? Okay, so this is God's character. It's the cross, right? That's what's being represented. 
Um, as the Lion of Judah, Christ will defend his chosen ones and bring them off victorious because they accepted him as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Christ the slain lamb who, was, lamb, who was despised, rejected, the victim of Satan's wrath, of man's abuse and cruelty. How tender his sympathy with his people who are in the world. And according to the infinite depths, depths of his humiliation and sacrifice as the Lamb of God will be his power and glory as the Lion of Judah for the deliverance of his people. Um, now, this, just trying to find where this statement was first. Um, I don't know where the original statement is. It's in a number of different books. It's in Acts of the Apostles. It's in lots of different uh, places. So if people want to look it up. Um, so I guess the main, the main idea here is that this lion roaring, we're going to say that this is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but it's, it's a message. It's 9-11. Right? It's 11-9. And during this period of time, we have to this movement, the unsealing of the seven thunders, which parallels the unsealing of, of the book of Daniel in Millerite history. Does that seem fair enough? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now we get this honey from the lion, and we can see that's eating of the little book, right? So we see that in uh, Revelation. Um, in Revelation chapter 10, where we have the seven thunders, right? So you can see we have this little book open, right? That's Revelation 10, verse 2. He had in his hand a little book open, right? So this is the line of the tribe of Judah. This is the one who has opened this book. In Revelation 10, 1, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet has pillars as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot upon on the earth and, with, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So we can see that this roaring lion here uh, connects to Revelation 10, verse 3. Right? So I probably could put that in here. Just put that there. Now, of course, we would apply this to Millerite history, right? But we can see that we are paralleling Millerite history. That's what Revelation chapter 10 is showing. That what happens in Millerite history is going to be sealed up with these seven thunders. And that is, they're not going to know their, their disappointment, in our history, those seven thunders are unsealed. That is, Millerite history is understood as we repeat it. Now, uh, someone had asked me a question regarding the seven thunders. I had written a paper on it. And they were reading it. Um, and they were asking about why the seven thunders lying uh, is different, why it's changed. And that was because initially when we were drawing out the seven thunders, we believed that they were the seven way marks or the seven events uh, in Millerite history. So we would say, well, the third first thunder is the first angel arriving. The second thunder is the first angel formalizing. The third thunder is the first angel empowered. We know now that that's not a correct way of understanding the seven thunders. Though I would think that anybody in this movement presently, that would be how almost everybody thinks of the seven thunders. That they're the seven waymarks, but they're not, right? So the seven thunders 
are a delineation of events, right? I mean, there is a delineation of events. They're setting upon a line. But the thunders themselves seal up the events. And they're unsealed in our history. That is, as we pass through the events, we unseal these thunders. So an argument was made by Peter Plum that we couldn't have the seven thunders be these seven waymarks because he was interpreting these thunders as these waymarks and not, not all of these waymarks are thunders. That is, they're not something that is heard. So, so we can't just do that. We can't just take these seven waymarks that we see here all the way up to the third angel arriving and saying those are the seven thunders. But we know that the seven thunders are the sealing up, the complete sealing up of Millerite history. And they're experienced in our time. So again, they're not going to be the way marks in our time. Because as we sealed up this, as we unsealed the seven thunders, they weren't unsealed in that way. What was happening is we were understanding the events of Millerite history, the significance of the lines of Millerite history. So in some ways, you know, you could say, well, they're related to the seven way marks, but they're not just directly the seven way marks. I don't know if that makes sense to people. I explain it better in the paper, but uh, by looking at Ellen White's statement. But if we if we take this understanding of Revelation chapter 10, that this lion roaring is uh, related to Millerite history, the, the events in Millerite history that are going to be sealed up in the seven thunders, we can see that in this movement, uh, not only is the book of Daniel also better understood, but Millerite history is better understood. And that lion roaring is that period to November 9th, 2019. This is the unsealing of the seven thunders. Doesn't mean they're all completely unsealed, but at least we have, we, we come to a certain point in our history on November 9th. And then we're gonna eat this little book. And you can see how when we eat this honey from the lion, right? We eat the little book. It's gonna be sweet in our mouth and bitter in our belly. Right. And that's going to be July 18. But then after July 18, we have the riddle. So this is at the end of the 777 days. This movement is proposed, has a riddle proposed to it from God. And part of that riddle is Colin's presentation. Part of that riddle is what Stephen presented. Part of that is uh, what was presented regarding uh, Ezra 7, 9, the three days, and how that uh, relates to the end of the 777. And also Odilio's study, which is going to come seven weeks later. It's going to be part of that. That's going to be the formalization of it. <clears throat> and then it's empowered on November 24th, 2022 when we find the 2688. And so what we see there with the 2688, tying that with the 1629, is that um, we have made an application for an additional extension of time uh, before we have to do our taxes. And now, what would that mean symbolically? Because we know that this has to do with the United States government tax form 2688. So how does that relate to this divorce? What do taxes represent according to Christ? Tribute. Okay. Tribute to who? Caesar. Okay, so Caesar. So this is about the state. Now, how does that relate to this divorce from the first day of the first month or first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month in the story of Ezra chapter 10? Why can Ezra do this? 
because he was he was accepting the laws of God to tell the people that they were not following after God that they'd followed after their own heart. Okay. And he was given civil authority because of uh, Artaxerxes decree. Right. Okay. So the fact that he had this civil authority to do this is an important aspect. Now, I don't know what that's, this particularly means in the context of this movement. But there has to be some authority, some civil authority involved in this divorcement. Right. I know in Canada, I mean, divorces are a civil matter, right? Not a criminal matter. You go to a civil court to get a divorce. And, and so this is going to be done according to the law, right? This divorce. That means uh, in, in the case of what happens in the story of Ezra, that means that the women are going to be compensated in this divorce. The children are going to be cared for. Uh, there's going to be alimony and child support, right? They're not just going to be cut off because they would die, right? I mean, a woman who's uh, been divorced, who's not cared for, um, is in a very precarious situation. She's not protected because the state doesn't really protect people. It's it's going to be families and structures that provide this protection for women. So this divorce, if it's not done according to the law, would be very cruel. But this is this is done according to the law. And um, so we're in this history of January 11th, 2023 to April 5th, 2030. We don't really know what it means. That is, we have some idea of what this divorce is about. We know it's a divorcing from the strange wives and that this strange wives bring in uh, an understanding of scripture that comes from the Protestant churches. And we know that we need to be corrected um, but this is done according to the law, and, and I would think that that would, would refer to Miller's rules. That is, when we're having, when we're getting rid of these strange wives, it's going to be done through a proper method of Bible study. And that is this line upon line method that's been given to us, and that's being witnessed to by these events and these dates. But what that's going to mean by April 5th, 2030, whether that's an actual date in which something is accomplished or whether it's just symbolic here, we don't know. But we have this application for the additional extension of time. And the implication there would be that this movement is being given time to sort out this domestic matter. But we also know that in these lines, we see things like a third angel arriving. And a third angel arriving shows up in different lines, and it's a symbol of a close of probation. And so we have to assume that people are closing their probation as they reject light. There isn't a close of probation, and it's not the close of probation. So it's not as if there is, you know, the closed of probation for, for everyone. It just has to do with these particular messages. And so now we're in this period of this, this divorcement. And that's going to be Samson's marriage that he has. And this marriage then, uh, his wife, um, in a sense, Samson goes through a divorce as well. I mean, a type of divorce, right? Now, we don't have a verse for this. So we have, in this line here, we have 15, verse 4 to 5, as being the second angel empowered. And Judah and Dan are both called lions, whelps in scripture. Genesis 49.9, Deuteronomy. Um, so what's a whelp? It's kind of an old-fashioned term. It's a lion's cub or a wolf cub, but this is a lion's cub. So the lion's cub. So they're baby lions, right? It's not even just like a young lion, 
This is like a lion cub, right? Um, now we know Samson was of the tribe of Dan, right? So he's a Danite. So, and we know Dan is the one of the tribes that is excluded in the 144,000 because he's a backbiter. He's a judge. He's um, critical, right? So, so, so Samson being a Danite, this describes uh, this movement very well in that aspect because it's been a problem in this movement. All of us have been a part of criticizing, making assumptions about other people instead of talking to the person. So we've been gossips, misrepresenting others' positions and, and not building up and supporting people in their struggles, just cutting them off, right? Blocking them, all these types of things, writing them off, whatever you want to call it. And this, of course, is a characteristic of Dan, the judge, which is similar to the accuser of the brethren. So it's a satanic character that we have. <clears throat> So anyway, getting back to this uh, way mark. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 15 here again. Okay, so 15. Um, now, this was this part where Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. So these 300 foxes, um, we know that this symbol brings us back to... Uh, the story of Noah, it brings us to Gideon, right? Um, it's 150 and 150 in the story of Noah. Um, so if we're looking at this verse and we're saying that this verse, these two verses, are related to November 9th, 2022, uh, how did we do that? Why would we take... Um, these 300 foxes and use it in this way. Does anybody have any thoughts about that? Didn't we look at this somewhat similar to what we were looking at with Gideon? Okay, yeah, we looked at Gideon. So what did we do? Well, they he had 300, and then here you have 300 foxes. Right. And 300, that he takes these torches, firebrands. Right, we have torches as well, yeah. Right. And... So you have the 300 or 150 pairs that are now going out to destroy the fields of grain of and, the Philistines. Yeah, and the olive and the vineyards and the olives. Right. Right. So you got the grapes and and the olives. So these are the teachings and doctrines of apostate Protestantism, right? Right. So, so that has to occur in this movement. Now, we had addressed this period of time from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month in with that 30-30-30 that we had. Those can represent three months, right? So I'm just going to show you this chart here. So this just again relates to this divorcement. This is just another symbol addressing that. So on the top there, you see 
Um, if we take 30 plus 30 plus 30, right? So we're taking that other part of that story, but we're taking these 30 uh, groomsmen and their 30 changes of, of raiment and the 30 uh, Philistines who get, you know, killed by Samson. Um, and you add those together, you're going to get uh, a period of three months, right? That's going to be um, 90 days. And if you take 90 days and you multiply it by a lunar month, you get 2,658. And if you count from December 25th, 2022, 2,658 days, it brings you to April 5th, 2030. But we had also used the 88 days in the story of Ezra 10. So from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month is 88 days. And if you multiply that from by a prophetic year, that will give you 2648. And if you count from the end of January 11th, 2023, 2,640 days, it brings you to April 5th, 2030. So there are two different ways that were brought there. And could this be the dividing of the two foxes? So the, the pairs of foxes, that this is a pair that gives us the same date. Does that make sense? Logical. Okay. Now, um, so we we'll go back to this line. So here we just need to put um, this symbol that's pointing to this as the 300 foxes. That's going to be in the story of the 300 foxes. So that's 15 verse 4 and 5. Now, then we have this date, of course, the first day of the 10th month, right? So this is setting up this, uh, this line that we're going to have the first day of the 10th month. Now, probably, so here, um, I guess I'm going to have to put these numbers because we have two different dates on that same way mark. They're both representing the... Uh, the first day of the 10th month, and you're going to have uh, 2,658 and 2,640. I'm just going to put both of those there. <clears throat> so you can see how you have that extra 30 days in there uh, from November 11th, 2022, to December 25th, November 24th, 2022, to December 5th. 2022. Right, so there's going to be that extra period of time, that 2658, 2688. That's from the end of November 24th to the beginning of December 25th. But anyway, we, we can see how that, that works out. Um, but we need a verse for here for the third angel arriving. So we're going to go to Judges 15. <clears throat> when the Philistine, and verse 6, then the Philistine said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son in law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Um, so they're going to be destroyed. Now, this, uh, the father-in-law and this other wife, um, these would be connected to um to this divorcement, right? 
I mean, I'm not sure how to how this how this fits in with this line. Um, but anyway, so it's going to be connected to those verses. And then in verse seven, and Samson said unto them, though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you. And after that, I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock, Eton. And then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why are you come up against us? And they answered, to bind Samson, we are come up to do to him as he hath done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went on the top of the rock, Eton, and said to Samson, knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And they said unto him, we are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, swear unto me that ye will not fall upon me yourselves. <clears throat> and they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistine shouted against him, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the, jaw, with the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramoth Lehi. <clears throat> now, um, so we've, we've addressed this a few times, and each time we see something more, and sometimes we, we, we clarify, we correct some of the things that we thought about it. Now, this story, we obviously have the jawbone of an ass, and we also have uh, his bands being loosed from off his hands. So we can see here the symbols of Islam. And we, we've said that the event of Nashville will occur. Right. So what was predicted on, on July 8th for July 18, 2020, we know that that event is going to occur. And this has something to do with that, something to do with Islam. But I don't know uh, exactly what it means, how we could apply it, you know, directly. But we just know that it has to do with uh, with that. And he's going to. Um, so how many men are going to uh, is it going to take to bind him? Does it say? Let me see here. He kills all these men. The men of Judah, does it say how many? Yeah, there are 3,000 men of Judah, right? So what's this 3,000 men of Judah on the top of the rock, Eton? So you got 3,000 men of Judah. So what is this representing? Is this leadership? 
Okay. Um, well, I don't think so. I wasn't having it as leadership. Okay. So these are men of Judah, right? So remember, Samson is a Danite, right? He's over in this area of the Philistines, right? On the border of the Philistines. But it's going to be men of Judah who are going to um, uh, be attacked. So the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. So... Why are the Philistines doing this? Why are they coming against Judah? Because Samson is within their territory, and the Philistines are afraid to face him. They figured that Samson's not going to attack other members of the children of Israel. Okay. So, so, the, so the reason is um, they're, they're seeking to have Judah... Um, the men of Judah capture Samson. So they want to deal with Samson, but they're going to come against Judah for that reason. Is that how you're seeing it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what's happening. It, it's not clearly stated, but I think that's what makes the most sense. Um, now, what about the 3,000 as a symbol? Well, it is a symbol, but a symbol of what? Yeah. So now 3,000, I mean, it, it kind of relates to the 300 as a symbol. Do we have any other examples of it? Okay, so 3,000 slain by the Levites or 3,000 baptized, not sure the connection. So so we have 3,000 in other places, right? Correct. Okay. Now, sometimes we can take the number and refer to it as a number of days. So I'm not sure... Um, particularly what we would do with that. Um, now, if we counted from April 5th, 2030, and we counted back 300 days or 3,000 days, we get to January 17th, 2022. Now, um, so January... 17th, 
2022? Is that significant in any way that anybody knows of? Yeah, we have 3,000 who joined the church in Acts 2, verse 41. So it's tied to Pentecost. It's tied to the Levites killing 3,000. It's tied to um, 3,000 that are baptized. Now, what if we take it as 3,000 days? We, we count 3,000 days prior to April 5th, 2030, and we get January 17th, 2022. Is that significant at all? It should be. Okay. You're saying it should be January 17th, 2022 should be? You asked if it was significant, and I said it should be significant. Okay, it should be significant. Okay, uh, but why is it significant? Do we know? Do we have anything that we can? Um, now, it, it's kind of interesting, at least for me, in in that when we look at the studies that we did, um, we do a study every morning, and... Uh, January, let me see here. I'm trying to find these dates. January. So I'm looking at the wrong year here. January 2022. For some reason they're not in order. I, I can't find that we did a presentation on that day, and I don't know why. It's a Monday. Um, here it is. So for some reason, I never, uh, I never ended up posting that on my, on my YouTube page. So, so it's not on my YouTube page for some reason. Oh. Well, I don't know if I even have it. So did we not do a presentation on that day? Oh. I may have given it the wrong date. Okay, that could be why. Yeah, okay, that's why. For some reason I gave it the wrong date. Gave it... Uh, I don't know why I did that. Anyway, that was where we were studying on the line of Abraham. So in 2022, we were still, we had just started that study uh, less than a month before. So I don't know if that means anything. I'm just saying that that's, I don't have any, uh, any way to explain it. But there may be something that I just don't know about. But anyway, if it was time, it would bring us back to uh, January 17th, 2022, 3,000 days before April 5th, 2030. So it's about eight years and uh, so many days. Yeah, eight years and 78 days. That's how long that period of time is. So, okay. 
so those are just things we're trying to figure out, whether that makes sense in any way, whether we'll understand it later on. I don't know. Now, when we look then at uh, this story, we have this 3,000 men. We have these symbols tied to 3,000, so it's not an uncommon symbol. But we just don't know how to apply it at this point. But um, we can see that they're they're going to bind him, right? And and then the, he's going to be loosed. Now they're going to bind him with two new cords, right? So we see this similar type of thing in the story of Delilah: the idea that you can bind him, but you obviously can't. <clears throat> so in this story, when we deal with two new cords. Um, string, a wreath of foliage, band, cord, rope, thick bough, branch. Um, and they're new, hadash, fresh. And there's going to be two of them, shanayim. Uh, right? So there's two of these. And there's this rock, Etam, that he's going to be on the top of when they come and get him. And, and then they're going to bring him to Lehi, right? So this is Lehi, we need know, is a word that refers to this jawbone, right? So the word itself is uh, um, jaw, right? Um. And he's going to kill a thousand men, right? With this, so we had three thousand men, and now we have a thousand. And we've dealt with ten thousand before. We've dealt with a thousand. So it's going to be two years and 269 and a half days. Whether we use it as a span of time somewhere. I don't know. Uh, let me see here. So I don't know. I don't know specifically what we could do with this thousand days if we took it as a thousand days. But anyway, we have a thousand that he's going to slay. And we looked a lot at the symbol of a thousand, what it means. But whether we can apply this here, I don't know. But anyway, he's going to be loosed. His bands are going to be loosed. And this is going to be a jawbone of an ass. And um, we know that the winds are loosed, and that's going to be Islam that is going to come as part of that, right, these winds. So can we say that this is, because um, it says in verse 17, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking. And what is speaking? It's just going to be the word debar, which means a word. Um, but is he, he's going to accomplish it. And he's going to accomplish his word. That he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi. So what can we see here?
Um, and even in verse 16, with the jawbone of an ass, ass, he says, heaps upon heaps. That's a doubling, right? Kamara, heaps. With the jaw of an ass, have I slain a thousand men? Now, um, now these words, heaps, is uh, it comes from 2560, Kamar. And it um, uh, and it's related compared to two five six zero, so it's a bubbling up that is water, a wave, earth, mire, clay. So it's something that bubbles up. It's a heap. And and then we have uh, an S two five four three, which is Kamor. So one of the things you'll see here. Um, heap is Kamora and ass is Kamor. So he's in this poem, because basically it's a poetic structure when he makes this acclamation. He's using a pun or a play on words with the word of heaps. He's, he's taking that from the word an ass, right? So the jawbone of an ass. So why does he do that? Why do we have puns in scripture? It's not for humor's sake. So what is he doing with this pun or this play on words? Angela says regarding the thousand, two years and nine months, that's a thousand days, could represent the 20th day of the ninth month of Ezra 10. Well, that's interesting because that's one of the things that we've, we've addressed here. Okay. So why does he use uh, a play on words? Does anybody know? Because we, we see lots of these in scripture in Hebrew. We don't notice them in English. Uh, Is it to get people to pay attention? Yeah, it's to get you to pay attention to something, that it's a prophetic symbol, right? Right. Okay. And so this heaps upon heaps is a doubling, right? Correct. And, and then we have this ass. Now, we know that we had made a prediction regarding July 18th. And in that line, July 18th was which way mark? Yeah, punning can be mockery too. Um, I don't know about that. Um, it, it, it's sometimes used in a mocking just because it's a play on words. And here it is. So when he's doing this, he's using this ass and he's making a play on words because he's slain these thousand men. And you could say that he's mocking, uh, but, you know, these guys are dead. So, I mean, you could mock the dead, I guess. But, I mean, more here it's about a prophetic, prophetic symbol that we're asked to pay attention to. Okay, so so we have this play on words. We have this doubling. We know that this can relate to what we had predicted, the midnight cry, however we, different ways we looked at the way mark of July 18th. But it's connected to the second angel's message. Right. So we sometimes had it as midnight, sometimes the midnight cry. But it's a doubling, right? Heaps upon heaps.
Okay. Yep. So there's a, a comment in the chat regarding High Heaps. Now, um, that's a book by Joseph Bates. So what was the idea of Joseph Bates book? Um, can't remember the exact title. I'll find it here. Because it's a history of, of Adventism. It's called Second Advent Waymarks and High Heaps. Okay, so if we have heaps upon heaps, um, it's a doubling. So what is this about? Uh, is this about the history of this movement in some way? About these way marks? So I, I don't have an answer to this, but I'm just saying that, that we have this heaps upon heaps. We have this jawbone of an ass. So it's something we have to consider. I mean, we didn't really look at this before. Um, I know we're just thinking here, but <clears throat> so some way we're going to have to take this story and we're going to say that it relates to this, this period of this divorce in some way. It relates to this period from January 11th, 2023 to April 5th, 2030. We just don't know how. Right? We don't we don't know what it is. We know he makes an end of speaking and he casts away the jawbone, right? So that means that that prophecy is fulfilled. You've come to uh, the end of that, right? That prophesied, whether that's April 5th, 2030, whatever that means, we don't know. And then he's going to be thirsty, right? He's going to be sore of thirst, Um that is vehemently uh, thirsty. Me'od means vehemently, utterly. So for some reason, he becomes thirsty after he prophesies. So he's going to need to be refreshed, right? And it's going to be from this hollow place. 
And so, so God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw. So, um, so some people just say, well, that's just Lehi, the place, right? So that just God makes a place for him to drink. Some people say it's, it's from the jaw itself, right? So it's not really clear. But he's going to drink and be revived. And, and they're going to change the name of this place or, or name it uh, uh, En Hakor, which is in Lehi unto this day, right? So I believe that that's just this hollow place in Lehi. <clears throat> Okay, so what do we do with this this uh, this line? Do we put that at April fifth, twenty thirty, as a symbol? Where do we put it? Do we know where we can put this on this line as a date? So think about Samson. Samson is this message, right? It's this message related to time, right? The understanding of time in this movement. And it's going to be connected with this separation from the strange wives, right? So we, we this divorcement. And he's going to, um, this message is going to speak when he's slain a thousand uh, Philistines. And the message that he gives, uh, and he's going to do this with the jawbone of an ass, right? And then he's going to give this message, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jaw of an ass have I slain a thousand men. Now, if we take this waymarks and high heaps as somehow connected, that is, Joseph Bates' book, it's it's a story about the Millerite movement and early Adventism, right? It's a history of this movement. And this is what we are doing in setting these things on a line, right? We're going through laying out these way marks on this line. So this is how this message is speaking. Does Am I making sense? And we've said before that the message has to be about Islam, that Islam is part of this, this message of this movement. Now, presently, if we look at this movement, is anybody interested in Islam? We made a prediction about Islam. Are we talking about Islam again? We're not, right? We're not talking about Islam again. But we know we have a message regarding Islam. But we haven't sorted it out. But we made predictions regarding Islam. Originally, the way marks that became Rafi and Paniyam were that we were, there, were, there were two events. That is, there was two events connected with Islam. That's how initially it was understood before we got to the Rafi and Paniyam, that we we're going to make these predictions. These are these strikes. So this is like 2016 and 17. We're talking about Islam in 2015 even. 
We're going to make this prediction. And then we make this prediction regarding Islam. Um, but this prediction doesn't really come to pass. So we're going to have to sort through this. We're going to have to solve this. I mean, maybe it will be understood clearly at the camp meeting. But this is what we're addressing here in Judges 15. And so we don't know particularly, if I go to our diagrams, And so if we go here, so we got, uh, so we're going to have verse uh, 15, I guess we're going to have to go. I'm not sure what verses we start with. But this first part dealing with, um, so I don't know where how we address this. Because we have a lot of verses here. So we'll do this tomorrow. Or not tomorrow, because today's Thursday. So we'll have to do this on Sunday. Um, we'll try to get this these lines drawn out so that we actually have some verses. But I think that this part, dealing with April 5th, 2030, is going to be these verses dealing with... Um, because this is going to be like verse six and onward. Um, and then over here, you're going to have the part dealing with Samson slaying the thousand. So this is going to be Samson um, uh, as well, uh, dealing with his uh, being captured. And then this is going to be him slaying uh, the thousand. So you're going to have the 3,000 here and the thousand here. I'm just going to do that down here. And you're going to have this thousand. At least that's how I see it right now. Okay, so somehow we have to figure this, how this line works. But one of the things it would point to is that the prediction that we're talking about with Nashville is still future, but it will occur. We're not predicting that it's going to occur on April 5th, 2030. But we do believe that somehow in that period of time, this message is complete. That is, the measuring of this time is complete. Um, I don't think that we're going to continue. And I'm not saying it's the year 2030. I'm just saying at some point we stop these lines in this way. Right, at some point, whatever that means. But what we're doing right now is not the message that we're giving to the Levites. We're not going to be going through all of these waymarks in our history and showing this. There's other things that we're going to show them, but it's it's still related to understanding this chronology of the prophetic periods, just not in the detail of our history. So hopefully, uh you know, we can get this sorted out next week because we still have a bit more to sort out. We still have Samson and Delilah, which I think we have a bit more sorted out. I think that one's a little clearer because one is it relates to this line. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, please be with us throughout this day. And help us in our personal study. And we pray for the studies tomorrow uh, evening and on Sabbath. And we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to teach us. Help us to be obedient to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.